Hello, my name is Swapnil Hiraman. I'm a nephrologist uh, at the University of Ottawa and welcome to the CAFE ISH series. And uh, let me talk about a little bit about how as a nephrologist I manage blood pressure in patients with severe CKD. I'm from the University of Ottawa in Canada and I tweet at H Swapnil. So to start off, of course, uh, given that we are uh, CAFE ISH, my choice of hot drink is actually a chai. Uh, and this is the one that I brewed earlier this morning with a little bit of cardamom and ginger. And uh, as evidence here it is, I'm drinking uh, my morning cup of tea. So for, in terms of the questions for chronic kidney disease, uh, what is really important is how do you reduce the blood pressure? Which medications do you use? Why do you even reduce blood pressure? You know, what are you looking for? What benefit are you, are you hoping to achieve in your patients? To what level should you be achieving blood pressure uh, in terms of targets? Which patient should you be doing it? And when? When to be aggressive and when to back off? And the answers are not easy. Uh, so I'm an evidence-based medicine kind of guy. Uh, and this is a really difficult field because when it comes to hypertension, in CKD stage four and five, uh, especially non-dialysis settings, it's really the wild west. There is nothing to guide us. Uh, so you can take it as you are free to do what you want. Uh, and there are many opinions with little evidence. So in CVS CKD stage four and five, there is really no data when it comes to trials. For example, even SPRINT excluded patients with a GFR of less than 20. In diabetes, in fact, there is hardly any trial data once you go to GFR below 45. And when it comes to guidelines, there are many guidelines. For example, on a recent episode of, a, of our podcast called Freely Filtered, we discussed the KDIGO hypertension guidelines. And let me tell you, this, there were six of us and we did not agree on any single thing. Uh, it, it made for a fun discussion, uh, but there was nothing definitive, uh, which just tells you that uh, this is really a, an area where clinical nuance is really important and, and seeing your patients and talking to them. So what do I mean by that uh, with respect to guidelines? This is the scenario as far as guidelines are concerned. Uh, ACC AHA, as you know, was very simple. Everyone gets 130 over 80. Uh, the European guidelines are really difficult to pass through. Uh, they say, hey, target this kind of blood pressure, but don't, do not go below that. And there are separate diastolic and systolic uh, guidelines. Uh, in, in particular, they have a floor. It's not that you lower blood pressure below 130, but do not go below 120, for example. I personally like the Australian guidelines the most, despite being a Canadian. Uh, they sort of say, you know, go for 140 over 90, uh, but go down to 120 if it is tolerated. In diabetes, for example, because Accord showed a stroke signal, uh, they say go to 120 if stroke is a priority. Uh, the recent KDIGO guidelines are pretty uh, intense. They say go for a systolic blood pressure target of less than 120, except for the transplant population of 130 over 80. The Canadian guidelines also similar to the Australian say, you know, target a lower blood pressure in high cardiovascular risk settings. So it's, it's kind of pick what you want, right? 120, 130, 140. It's like having a veritable buffet of guidelines to pick for. So uh, a sensible advice is that lower is better and aim toward 120, where toward is doing a lot of heavy lifting. Uh, whether you achieve 120 or not, uh, try to achieve a lower blood pressure. But do keep in mind what is your goal. So this is a da data from uh, Pietro Ravani and colleagues from Calgary, uh, and it really shows that most CKD patients die of heart disease uh, and die of other causes. And very few, you know, there is a very tiny sliver in between. Those are the ones who develop kidney failure. So the risk of dying is way more than the risk of kidney failure. So you really, you should be treating blood pressure for those kind of goals and not necessarily for preventing kidney failure. And this is shown even more so with the BP trial is collaboration meta-analysis showing here the effect of a standardized 10 millimeter reduction in blood pressure. So you see reduction in cardiovascular events of about 20%, reduction in death of just over 10%, heart failure and stroke huge, you know, about 30% reduction, but kidney failure, there's nothing. Uh, so better blood pressure control really protects the brain and the heart, it does not prevent kidney failure. So don't talk about kidney failure when you're reducing blood pressure in your patients with CKD. When it comes to drugs, uh, it, it's, it's a myth that chlorothalidone does not work, that thiazide-like diuretics do not work in CKD stage four. This is a pilot trial from Rajiv Agarwal showing a nice blood pressure drop with chlorothalidone, 
by anywhere from 10 to 15 millimeters of mercury, yes, there are more adverse events. There was more hyponatremia, hypokalemia, hyperuricemia. The creatinine went up. So yes, you may have to back off in some patients, but in other patients, you can use chlorothalidone even with severe CKD. What about RAS blockade? This is a really nice framework to keep in mind from Steve Coca about permissive hypercreatinemia. What that means is that even if the creatinine goes up when you have actually started a drug such as uh, you know, ACE inhibitor or an ARB, a diuretic in the setting of volume overload, a flozin, it's a good thing. It's fine for the creatinine to go up. It does not represent kidney injury. It just means hemodynamics. Uh, so if there is a strong indication, such, especially such as proteinuria in CKD, someone with diabetic nephropathy, do not stop the RAS inhibitors just to make the creatinine number better. Be brave and carry on. Do be aware of alpha blockade. These drugs are very convenient because of a lack of metabolic side effects. This is a large database study that we did a couple of years ago showing that alpha blockade use, we know they cause, uh, you know, first dose effect, they cause orthostatic hypotension. It was affected, it was associated with more, uh, you know, uh, syncope uh, as well as falls in our uh, data set. And, and flozination, uh, so SGLT2 inhibitors do reduce blood pressure. This is, the, uh, this is a nice visual abstract from Denis Serrano, but we can see that from DAPA CKD, not only did we have beneficial effects as far as cardiovascular and kidney effects are concerned, but this drug was started all the way until a GFR of less than 25. The heart failure trials, they went down to a GFR of 20. And in these trials, as well as in credence, the flozins were not stopped till the patient started dialysis. So in all these studies, um, the, the use of flozins they reduce blood pressure as well by four to four over two millimeters after controlling for the placebo uh, or the control group. So you may see an even greater effect. So, so keep them in mind when you're looking for an additional blood pressure effect uh, and you get some end organ benefit also at the same time. But at the same time, no when to bail, right? So stiff arteries are very common. This was a Twitter discussion last week uh, with a very, very, very interesting discussion sparked by Amit Langote, who was a former fellow here and is a nephrologist in Mumbai, you can see that this kind of blood pressure is very common. You see a wide pulse pressure, you see a really low, low uh, diastolic pressure. I don't even know if the re systolic pressure is really that high or it, it does it represent some arterial stiffness. So you, in this kind of a patient, you're not going to achieve 120 and do not go to try to achieve 120. Lower the blood pressure as much as the patient can tolerate, but don't really go for 120. And at really low GFR levels, uh, sometimes you have to keep some pragmatic decision making into account. Uh, will stopping the diuretic or the ACE ARB buy you some a few more months so that the fistula can mature or you can get a PD catheter in or they get a preemptive transplant? So it's okay to use, you know, the clonidine or the hydralazine in this kind of a setting to let you, you know, buy some time and stop the ACE inhibitor. We do need more trials. Stop ACE is one such trial which should be coming out soon from UK, from Birmingham. The EMPA kidney is finished enrollment. It went down to a GFR of 15, so we'll have some more data uh, from those trials as well. Uh, so my suggestions in brief is that shared decision-making is really important. Understand your patient's goals when you're making blood pressure treatment decisions. Be brave and try to continue ACE inhibitors and ARBs, especially if there is heart failure or proteinuria. Uh, Thiazide-like diuretics can be useful, especially you can, if the patient tolerates them without uh, metabolic and electrolyte side effects. And lowest tolerated is still very important, you know. So, uh, so try to reduce blood pressure, whether you achieve a certain goal or not, doesn't matter. Even going from 150 to 140 is still useful for reducing cardiovascular risk. These are the citations that you can look for for the few evidence that I have uh, that I discussed today. Uh, and do uh, go ahead and see the other uh, videos in the ISH Cafe uh, from the International Society of Hypertension. Um, enjoy. Thank you.